I wanted to clarify something from last time about the precession of a symmetric rigid body. So these are just two images. This is the you know free precession. That's what it's called. Free precession of a symmetric rigid body. In terms of these cones. So the way that you're to understand these cones is there's a cone that's fixed in space and it opens up around the angular momentum vector. So it's this cone. I don't have a cone, should have got a cone. And there's another cone that's on the body that's um, centered on that the B3 direction of that body. And the motion that you have, it's as if you have the two cones rolling without slipping about one another. And so that's, that's a way to visualize the motion. You have this space cone and a body cone. So that's what's being depicted here. In one, in one case for the uh, kind of tall skinny things, you have the body cone outside of the space cone and it's rolling around. So uh, it'll give a certain type of motion. In the other case, you have the space cone is inside the body cone, but still they are rolling without slipping. And I've got a, from the, uh, Wolfram has a demonstration that I can show some some videos from uh, if I can find it. Yeah, okay, here it is. So this is it's called the you can you can actually just Google Wolfram demonstrations. Look at free precession of a rotating rigid body and it's got these sliders. Unfortunately it doesn't work well on my um, iPad. It works on uh, the computer pretty well. So this is a tall, skinny thing. And we've got a, let me freeze this again. What do we got? We've got the, this, it uses the, the terminology L for the angular momentum um, um, instead of H. That's sometimes used in the physics literatures, L for angular momentum. So angular momentum is fixed in space. And then we've got omega, which will be moving. Remember, it's gonna be that point of contact of these two fictional cones. And you can see there's a little option over here on the left where you, I'll show the cones. So this starts out um, and then we can get it animating. I don't know what's going on there. There we go. So I press play and you can see this thing moving. You've got the three body fixed axes rotating with respect to the inertial axes. But now you can show the, the cones. The gray thing is the space cone. And then the blue is the body cone. And it's as if the two are rolling without slipping, their point of contact being the angular momentum vector. So you can, you can see the sense in which the, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm moving this so that it looks more like the figure where the space cone is aimed up and you could see what's happening here. The body is rotating in a, you know, right-handed sense where my thumb is pointing along the blue uh, B3 direction and my fingers are curling. So we've got that rotation. Now, if I change it, so I make the height small and increase the radius. So now we've got something that's short and wide like a plate or a coin. Now the space cone is inside the body cone, but they're still, it's as if they're rotating. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 it's, they're in contact rolling without slipping and the point of contact is still the omega vector, the angular velocity. And the sense in which the body is rotating is opposite from before. So that's what these, these cones mean. So this is just the view from the top of the space cone, okay? So hopefully that 
you could either play with that Wolfram demonstration. Um, and so that, that's what's going on. It's like they're rolling without slipping. So, so that's good to know. All right. Uh, what else? Well, you could understand the, uh, so either homework problem two or three, whichever one you choose to do, um, it's one of these situations that, that you're studying. I think problem two is the, you know, the tall skinny thing. And the uh, problem three is the flipping of a coin and how to trick people, essentially. Because um, if you hit a, a coin edge on, so I've got some videos for that. I didn't take these videos. But I've got them. Uh, one of these is, is the good one. Shows what I want. I think it's this one. So there's this is high speed video by someone else of a, a coin toss. And they've hit it so that the angular momentum is almost horizontal. It's pretty close to horizontal. So this has a, let's say, close to 50-50 chance of landing heads up. So this is a, a good coin toss. But you could you could bias this situation because um, if we look at if we use that same Wolfram demo, and now here is a coin, and we've hit it in such a way that the angular momentum is close to vertical, right? The blue bobbed thing denotes heads, the side that was in initially up, and that side stays up. All right, let's start that again. So the side that is up when we, let's say we've, we've flipped it now and we flipped it so that the angular momentum is in that direction. Well, the head side is actually always up. It's just like a plate or a coin that's just kind of wobbling. If, I, if we hit it closer to, ed, let's say as close as we can to edge on, then we'd have a situation like this. And now, right, it spends half the time with the head side up. So this would be a good 50-50 one. And if we're close, if we hit it so that it's, you know, kind of in between. So now it's, it spends some of the time with the head side pointing up and some of the time with the head side pointing down, but it's actually spending most of the time with the head side pointing up. So what, what you're supposed to do is take an average of how often is the head side pointing up. So average over one spin cycle, and you'll be able to get that. So if, if we were to look at, um, say, heads as a function of time for two different ways of tossing it, on the left, this is, um, and we're just taking the dot product of the B3 direction. Let's say here's our coin, and here's B3. Take the dot product of the B3 direction with the, um, I think I called it N3, the local vertical direction. And so that would be, when they're exactly aligned, that will be one. And when they're exactly opposite, that would be negative one. And then if it's somewhere in halfway, it'll, you know, the dot product will, will be zero. So if you took that dot product as a function of time, you'd get the figure on the left for an edge on hit of the coin. If you kind of had this biased a, a little bit, then it would be spending most of its time um, pointing up and then maybe say 25% of the time pointing down. And that's the situation depicted on the right. So you're asked to do calculations for that and then you can get this plot of what's the probability of, uh, of heads. So we're, we're making an assumption that after you've got the coin flipped, uh, we're just looking at the fraction of the time in which heads is pointing up so that if you were to like grab it in midair, okay, which side is up? And if you, uh, you could see that the 50% mark is just hitting it exactly edge on. So there is a slight bias. And there was a paper where they even looked at how people flip coins and they found that the side that is initially up will be up 51% of the time for the average hit because we don't, we can't actually hit it exactly edge on. There's a little bit of a bias. 
So it's always a good tip to, to uh, bet on the side that's initially up, staying up. Just kind of interesting. It's all physics. So even though we consider the coin toss as like this paradigm of randomness, it's not. Um, there was a group that came up with a coin flipping machine so that they could <laughs> always, you hit it just right and then any coin toss, if you know the number of times that it's uh, flipped around, you could uh, guarantee it'll land the correct side up. Which, I mean, I'm not gonna trust anybody if they said, oh, I have this special machine, let's use that to help make our decisions. I'm not gonna do that. So there's also a paper that you're welcome to look up, dynamical bias in the coin toss. That's where I, I, got, I got this problem. But they use uh, some, they use different uh, terminology. So it might might be confusing, although you're, you're welcome to look at it. I like that problem more than just the like soda can that's spinning. But you could do the soda can that's spinning if you want. I call it a soda can. It's just a, you know, a solid cylinder. That's long. All right. What I wanted to talk about today, because we've sort of laid the, the groundwork, we first talked about um, torque-free bodies, so things spinning out in space or spinning with um, zero torque or approximately zero torque. Uh, the symmetric case, now we're going to look at the full case. So not symmetric. And we had to discuss the uh, the energy first so that we could even get to this, this part. So this is the, right, it's the torque free rigid body or just the free rigid body. And we're talking about now arbitrary I1 I2 and I3. So we're not making any conditions on what these what these are. I'm going to be following example 11, 17 in in the book, and we're going to be we'll uh, consider conserved quantities. So we'll have two conserved quantities because there's no moments. Because there's no moments, the energy won't change. Once you have something flipped or tumbling around, it has a certain rotational kinetic energy about its center of mass. And that kinetic energy won't change in principle. Um, so we have energy, specifically kinetic energy, and the other is uh, ang angular momentum. Once you get a body spinning, it's got a angular momentum vector that will be constant in space. So it's the angular momentum is the other one. So we're considering these two. So what about the, uh, let's start with energy. And remember, we ended last time talking about the kinetic energy of a rigid body. So the total energy in this case would be the energy, the kinetic energy of the motion about the center of mass plus uh, any potential energy. But there is no potential energy because this thing is, it's a free rigid body. There's no, there's no forces acting on it. So we just have the kinetic energy about the center of mass. And the way that we wrote that last time, one half, um, I mean, this is one way to write it, omega dot IG omega. If we put in all of our, you know, superscripts and subscripts, it's the angular um, velocity of the, and we've got our body fixed frame, the B frame, and how that 
is moving with respect to the inertial frame. Maybe let's describe that with a green angular velocity here. We're describing everything though in the body fixed frame components. So we've got omega, this would be transpose, omega transpose times the three by three moment of inertia matrix times omega. And let's suppose that we use a, use a principal axis frame. If we use a principal axis frame, why do we do that? That means that IG is going to be a diagonal matrix with entries I1, I2, and I3. So that makes life easy. So the kinetic energy, which is a constant, will be constant, it's gonna be one half I1 omega one squared plus one half I2 omega two squared plus one half I3 omega three squared. Because there's no moments, this is constant throughout the motion. Okay. So what will we do? We will, we're gonna view omega one, omega two, and omega three as axes of an abstract space that we're, we'll call phase space. So let's view omega one, omega two, and omega three as axes It's kind of like, you know, when you describe the motion of a particle in 3D, you use X, Y, and Z. Well, now we're describing the rotation. So we're free to pick as axes, omega one, omega two, omega three, and the instantaneous um, configuration of our system will be a point in this three-dimensional space. And whenever we do that for uh, um, dynamical systems, systems that evolve in time, we call that phase space. So this is our phase space. The point, there'll be some point in phase space. If you want, you know, draw a, a vector from the origin to that point, and that is describing the angular velocity, but viewed in the body fixed frame. So we have this, and we're going to rewrite the, this energy formula. If we rewrite this energy formula, it'll put some, um, we're gonna rewrite it as, so it looks like this. We just divide by um, 2G. Right, no, I guess we're, yeah, we're just dividing by TG. I mean, two TG divided by I2. So when we rewrite this energy formula from above, it looks like this, which you might recognize this formula if we, it, if we wrote it in terms of x, y, and z, it looks like x squared over a squared, where a is a constant, y squared over b squared, where b is a constant, plus z squared over c squared, where c is a constant. This is the formula for an ellipsoid. where the, 
these A, B, and C are called the semi-major axes or semi-minor axes. They are the uh, half the distance of the ellipse. So this would be like 2A um, in the Y direction, we have this thing being 2B and in the Z direction, 2C. So an ellipsoid is the three-dimensional generalization of an ellipse, right? the oval shape. So we've got this three-dimensional shape, an ellipsoid. That means that this red dot in this upper figure here that describes where the angular velocity is, it has to be on an ellipsoid given by the energy. So we call this the energy ellipsoid. energy ellipsoid. So as this point, if it evolves in time, it has to evolve to stay on this ellipse, ellipsoid. So think of a, a point, it has to move on the surface of this ellipsoid in this space that represents the three body fixed components of angular velocity. So this means that omega one the point omega one, omega two, and omega three as a function of time must stay on this energy ellipse. Void, ellipsoid. Okay. <clears throat> that was just the first conserved quantity. And what I want you to see here is that what we call the conserved quantity, the conserved quantity of energy in this case, corresponds to some geometric object in the space of the variables. In this case, it corresponds to an ellipse, an ellipsoid. So what about angular momentum? Angular momentum will probably correspond to some other geometric shape. And then we'll be having to look at how do these two geometric shapes intersect because that's the only place that the angular velocity can be, because it has to, it's, this is kind of like a geometric constraint. You have something that's evolving, has to be on this ellipsoid, but now we look at angular mo momentum. What about angular momentum? So if we go back to the kind of fundamental formula, or how does the angular momentum evolve? The angular momentum of a rigid body about its center of mass is gonna be equal to the moment, but in this case, there is no moment. So that means that the angular momentum is a constant vector. It's a constant vector, so constant, magnitude and direction in inertial space. Let's say in the inertial frame. But when we transform into body fixed coordinates, it won't be constant necessarily. So let's say this thing is a, we're writing the, this is the angular momentum vector written in the inertial frame, the I-frame, this is a constant vector. But if we look at the angular momentum in the body fixed frame, this could move, meaning it won't be constant. It could move, but um, it'll have to keep a constant magnitude because going into the body fixed frame, it's just a matter of rotation. And maybe you know that rotations, the way that rotations affect vectors is they just rotate them. They can't change their magnitude. So it could move, but it will keep a constant magnitude.
so what does that mean? Um, if we were to look at the angular momentum, um, it's more convenient to look at angular momentum squared. This is a constant. And what are the components? Well, the components in the body fixed frame, uh, it's I1 omega 1, I2 omega 2, I3 omega 3. So we're basically taking this vector, the body fixed frame. So this is I1 squared omega 1 squared plus I2 squared omega 2 squared I3 squared omega 3 squared. This is equal to a constant. Now, what does this look like? This looks like if we treated this as x squared, and if we treated this as y squared, we treated this as z squared. It's, the different, it's different from the x squared, y squared, z squared up above. I'm just trying to show you the form that these formulas give us. This equals r squared. So it looks like a sphere. Looks like a sphere. So we have the energy ellipsoid and the momentum sphere. So in this abstract space of omega one, omega two, omega three, the space of the variables that we're calling the, uh, uh, phase space. Geometrically, conservation of angular momentum corresponds to the motion is on a sphere, a momentum sphere. So we've got a momentum sphere. So the angular momentum, remember that's some kind of, if you want, it's a vector pointing from the origin to a point in, in this space, the tip of that vector has to be along this sphere. No matter what happens according to the um, uh, Euler's equations that describe, you know, how omega one dot, omega two dot, omega three dot, how those evolve in time. We haven't even used those yet. We've just been using the idea of well, there, there are these conserved quantities that constrain how these points can, can move. And so now we've got, we've got an energy ellipsoid and a mo momentum sphere. And the angular velocity vector has to be at the intersection of these two things. So what we, what we have for some kind of generic case, uh, so I'm sketching, there's omega one, omega two, omega three, We've got um, a momentum sphere and an energy ellipsoid. So I'm just going to draw an, an ellipsoid that's elongated in the, uh, the third direction here. And it would, uh, an ellipsoid will intersect a sphere in circles. So let's just go down here. So depending on the different values of I1, I2, and I3, this energy ellipsoid will look different. I'm just showing one particular case. But the, the main thing here is that the that omega vector, the angular velocity vector viewed in the B frame, and that's that's basically what we're doing here, must be at the intersection of the energy ellipsoid and the momentum sphere. It's kind of like there's these two geometric constraints and the only place they coincide is where you have these two shapes intersecting. The energy ellipsoid
the momentum sphere. So in this case, there are, for the case shown, that would be like the angular velocity could be along this circle up here, kind of pointing up, or it could be along this circle down here, pointing down, and it'll be moving in a, some particular way. Okay. I think I have some cool video that will show this. So many cool videos. Where to even begin? Um, I think this is, this one looks cool. Okay, they use different notation. I didn't make this video, but this is basically showing the same thing of, um, and they even show the body over here. So for this case, you have the ellipsoid just inside the sphere. So this is rotation about the, you know, one of the axes. Here's another kind of arbitrary one where the ellipsoid um, and the sphere intersect in two, they're not circles exactly, but closed curves. And that's the kind of motion that it, it will look like. Now we're going to increase things again till we get to this case of um, this is motion along the intermediate axis and as we know motion along the in intermediate axis that means that this is saying x2 y2 z2 this is omega 1 omega 2 and omega 3 space and that white curve is that's the what the angular velocity is moving al along so you can see it it's kind of jumping from the plus y2 direction to the negative y2 direction. And I, I, it takes a while to go through that case. Let's just, okay, we get it, that's unstable. So now it's, we're looking at a different case of a, a sphere and an ellipsoid intersecting. So you see this kind of wobbling going on and then um, the next possible, uh, well, the next one that it'll, it'll look at is where the sphere is exactly inside the ellipsoid so that they intersect only in two points. So along the, this red, this X2 direction, which is the direction of, um, the maximum principal moment of inertia. So that's kind of a cool video. If you were to plot uh, what things look like, this is just taking a selection of intersections of the momentum uh, sphere and energy ellipsoid and just showing contours that correspond to what the angular velocity can do. So you see there's closed curves. If I were to draw, if I can draw on here. There's closed curves, right, up here, which means that if you start a little bit off of the I3 direction, it's gonna be stable. Over here to the left, you start a little bit off of the I1 direction, things will also be stable. They'll just kind of move around. But if you start a little bit off of the I2 direction, well, things will, like, let's say you start here, well, you're gonna just sort of go away. Or if, if you start this direction, you'll come close and then go away. It looks like a saddle point. And that's one way to understand the, the instability. Um, here, if you look at things in the angular momentum space, then you have a, uh, uh, well, it's the same thing that we had. We had a momentum sphere and energy ellipsoid, so forget about what that says. This is, these are just omegas, omega two, omega one. And then this is showing the trajectory. So this is just showing an arbitrary um, thing, but it's not as, the picture's not as cool because it's a polyhedral rather than extremely smooth. Okay, so that's, that's cool. Um, you might wonder, well, what happens if you add dissipation? So if, if there is some kind of damping, then 
these curves, um, instead of closing up on each other, they're all, everything's going to evolve towards stable states. So this is showing the situation for, um, it might be hard to see here, but everything goes towards the direction of minimum energy. So largest principal moment of a, an, an inertia. And this was seen in an actual satellite, I think launched in the 50s or 60s. Here's another picture. So this is showing, if you could see it over here, things are leaving, going away from the, mina, the minor axis. They always were going away from the intermediate axis. They don't stick around, they leave. And things are just, are spiraling in to the major axis. So over the long term, if you have some damping, some dissipation, some friction, you will have a uh, rigid body motion always along the, the major axis. So it turns out for the Earth, the Earth is like a squished thing and it's rotating about its major axis. So we don't have to worry about the Earth flipping around. Um, you might wonder, well, where's the dissipation coming from there? I think it has to do with the, there's a liquid mantle core, maybe something to do with the moon, I don't know. But the Earth is rotating about its major axis, so we don't necessarily have to worry about you know, what if the poles suddenly became the intermediate axis? Then, oh, you know, everything would move around. That's unlikely. Unlikely. Okay. Is there, are there questions about this? Because I know this, this is kind of weird. It's momentums. Uh, the intersection of these shapes and phase space. Any questions about it? Does the so you mentioned like sphere and uh, sphere and ellipsoid, but in that video they were, you know, kind of wonky intersection. Um, does the magnitude of the momentum, uh, or yeah, moment of inertia, does that affect the shape or like the size of this stuff? Yeah. So that the size of that ellipsoid depends on um, the size of I1, I2, and I3. So if you have something like this, this magic Apple pencil, um, this is a rigid rod, so, but it's got some, something to it. So the ratio of I1, I2, and I3 will be something in particular. Uh, for some other other shape, I don't I don't know what it'll be. As those become closer and closer to being equal, so a perfect sphere or a perfect cubicle box, I one and I two and I three will actually all be the same. Um, so that does affect things. In fact, let me go back to this because so you you brought up a, a, a good point. If we have if you have, I think this shows it the best. If you have a symmetric body like we were talking about for precession, then the intersections of the sphere and the ellipsoid are going to look something like this thing on the left. So you have a bunch of closed curves. You don't have an intermediate axis. In fact, along this kind of equator here, every point is actually a fixed point. So there's no rotating around, it's fixed. If you have a body with all of the moments of inertia equal, then you get every direction is a stable point. So that means you could have pure rotation about any direction. It's just that things with all the moments of inertia equal um, are, are rare. Like, I don't know if we could even machine them, but um, they're an idealization, but yeah. So it's really just the ratio of um, these different moments of inertia that affect what that the intersection of the ellipsoid with the sphere will, will look like. So for this thing on the right, the ellipsoid, ellipsoid actually is a sphere. So that means the sphere and the ellipsoid intersect in all points. And so every point is an equilibrium point. Thank you. So I don't know if that uh, helped address your concern, but yeah. 
Uh, all right. And you don't need a symmetric looking body to actually get um, moments of inertia to be equal. I think you could take some arbitrary shape and then just start shaving off mass on different sides. So you could have a really weird shape where all the moments of inertia just happen to be equal. And, uh, I've never, I've never done that. I mean, I've never tried to create such a shape, but I think it's possible. All right. There's another topic that I wanted to go over. And it's kind of related to that Frisbee question. The ungraded question for that homework problem. And this is, this is the idea of spin stabilization. Which is used a lot in um, aerospace. So this means you, you, you spin something. You're spinning a thing with a non-zero external moment. Uh, to achieve some desired outcome. And I think the, uh, the you know, Frisbee or disc is a good way to introduce this. I know Frisbee, I think Frisbee used to be a brand name and now it's actually in the dictionary. Frisbee disc. So um, what do we got? So the situation for a Frisbee, let's say, I don't, this isn't a Frisbee, it's a plate, but let's view, and this works I think pretty well for anything that's kind of disc shaped. So if you have a disc and I you know, move it, there's gonna be some, some moments. So here is the disc viewed edged on. So disc viewed edge on from the side. So we've got, if you were to toss this thing and let go, there'll be some relative motion of the air. So this is the you know motion of air. I don't necessarily want to call it wind. And so let's say you've you've thrown this directly horizontally. So the horizontal direction, let's call that E1. The um, vertical direction is E2. And then to complete this right-handed coordinate system, because it's going to come up, we need E3, right? Right hand, E1, E2, E3. And now um, on this body, we've got some body fixed directions. Actually, we will, so there's, there's a center of mass. And we're looking at a, so this is somewhat abstract. We've got a frame, reviewing a frame that's where B1 is always pointing in the direction that this thing is, is moving, even though this might be spinning. So we're constructing a frame that's a moving frame, but not necessarily a body fixed frame. And then this is B2, I'll call that B2. So the B1, B2, uh, B3 is coming out of the screen at you. Now, when I, when I toss anything like this sideways through air or some kind of fluid, but let's think of air, there's gonna be a aerodynamic force on it. So I'll just plot the kind of distribution of aerodynamic force as some kind of plot of, this is giving the say little f arrow. At each point along the disc, there's a, there's a force. Um, and the way that that's often dealt with in aerospace is you, you just pick some point P, well, you find the point P that is, it's called the center of pressure. 
And it's as if you could write the lift and drag forces as happening only at that point. So P is the center of pressure. And this is where, I'll put this as orange, you have the force of lift. Remember, lift is um, upward and normal to the velocity. So this thing is actually moving to the right, but in the frame of the body, it looks like air is coming toward it. And then we've got the force due to drag. And it it's at it's happening at this COP, center of pressure. <clears throat> We're gonna look at two cases of this thrown disc. First case is we don't spin it, we just toss it. Okay. This works better when I'm in the classroom and can actually throw things around if they give me enough room, but um we'll make do so first we're going to assume that the disc is not spinning so that means we we're going to write it in terms of angular mo momentum so not spinning means the angular velocity is zero it also means the angular momentum is zero Well, the angular momentum is zero initially, okay? But then we look at what is the time rate of change, inertial time rate of change of the angular momentum. So this is Euler's second law, and this is going to equal the moment due to the forces on here. So the moment due to aerodynamic forces. And what is the moment due to aerodynamic forces going to be? Well. We need to look at what is the, the location of the center of pressure. So this is R, P, so G. And we'll say that this is a distance capital R in the B1 direction. Okay, it's important that it be forward of our, the center of mass. So when we, when we write out what the this moment due to the aerodynamic forces is, we get R B1 cross negative FD. So F, the force due to drag is in the negative B1 direction. So that's just what I'm writing there, plus R B1 cross the force due to lift, which is in the positive E2 direction. Now let's write this in terms of the tilt of the disc. The tilt of the disc with respect to the horizontal, we'll call that angle, um, it's, a, it's a pitch angle, essentially. We'll call that theta, okay? So this angle of the B1 direction with respect to the E2 direction is theta. So if you work out what these cross products are, you'll get R, FD sine theta plus R FL cosine theta. And that's all in the B3 direction. So let's call this the scalar M arrow, the moment due to aer aerodynamic forces. Everything here is positive. So this is positive. So what does that mean? It means that the angular momentum is going to increase in the B3 direction. It starts out as zero, and then shortly it will become non-zero in the B3 direction. And I think I have another uh, figure here that can be useful. I can find it. Here's my Frisbee stuff. Is it here? Spinning, it is a spinning oblate thing. So maybe it's in here. There we go. Okay, awesome. So, uh, it is sort of a poor reproduction, but there it is. 
what's being shown here. This is, we've got the COP, the center of pressure, we've got the center of mass, and this is showing lift and drag. We've got the B2 direction. This direction is B1, and this direction is B3. If we have a, an angular momentum that's in the B3 direction, um, so let's just say after a short time, we have that the angular momentum has some non-zero angular momentum that I put IHB, I mean IH, about the center mass. This will be something in the B3 direction with H greater than zero and I omega B is going to be theta dot B3 um, yep where theta dot is greater than zero right this is inducing since it's inducing a uh, non-zero angular momentum in the B3 direction, we're going to have a non-zero angular velocity in the B3 direction, which means that theta dot is increasing. So if you were to toss the disc, and you can, you can, you can try this. You can try it with any, you know, just cut out a piece of cardboard and don't spin it, just toss it. And you'll, what you'll see is it it starts tumbling and it first tumbles in pitch. So the disc tumbles in pitch. And it doesn't it doesn't go very far. It falls to the ground. And that's not what I want when I play frisbee. I want this thing to go farther. So I'm not getting my desired outcome. But that's what I get because I didn't spin it. So this is the whole idea of spin stabilization. Something magical will happen once I both throw this and get it spinning, because then it has some, it'll have a, an angular momentum that's non-zero and might um, change things. So it tumbles in pitch. So now assume we get it spinning a lot. What does a lot mean? You know, a lot. So we have it initially spinning the IHG equals H. And the way that we're getting it spinning, it's a it's gonna be in this B2 direction. So maybe I'll draw it on on here. I H G. So this is spinning about the B2 direction, the, uh, the symmetry axis of this disc. Uh, so once I toss this, it's got this large angular momentum. All right, so then what? And so I am spinning it, okay, for that to be H equals positive, I'm spinning it a certain way. It means I'm spinning it, uh, Viewed from above, it is counterclockwise. So then what? Now we can use our qualitative analysis just to find out what will happen. So if you remember what the qualitative analysis says, it says, it, so this is spinning so rapidly that the IHG as viewed from this moving B frame is essentially zero. So all we're looking at is, all we're left with from Euler's second law is omega cross H equals the moment. So now we have to figure out 
what is the angular velocity which cross h in the b2 direction gives us m arrow in the b3 direction so that's that's what we're asking what what direction that's all we're asking what direction is the angular velocity to make this true that's the qualitative analysis and it turns out uh, so we need something cross the b2 direction equals the b3 direction well that something is b1 so i omega b must be in the b1 direction So that's qualitatively different than what we had up here when we started out at no spinning. Omega was most was rotating about the B3 axis. Now we've got it, it's got to be about the B1 axis. Okay. So, so instead of uh, related to pitch, now it's related to roll. Right. And um, how do we, this isn't following the usual convention of you know, um, the body fixed B1, B2, B3. But if we know that we've got rotation that's positive about the B1 direction, then this means this thing is rotating this way. So it would roll to the right. So I omega B is let's call it omega b1 with b1 positive. So if we call that, uh, um, it's going to be, as this is moving, and this is the b1 direction, it's going, from my point of view, looking down, it's curving to the right. Roll to the right. And we used theta to describe roll. So theta dot is equal to omega, which is equal to, um, we can get quantitative now. It's the moment due to the arrow, the, the, the aerodynamic forces divided by H. And this is small. Why is that? Since we assumed H is large. Okay. So if you were to throw a Frisbee, it's kind of hard to do it. You'd have to do, this is actually a, a normal left-handed throw because when you left-handed throw, it'll be spinning uh, counterclockwise. And so a left-handed throw according to this analysis, should veer to the right. And by the same analysis, a right-handed throw, it's gonna have a, a negative age. So you'd be rolling to the left. So you should try that. This is the ungraded homework. And that's how, uh, this is spin stabilization because it's rolling just a little bit and instead of just tumbling, when we didn't have a large angular momentum, you toss it and it just sort of tumbles to the ground. When you get something spinning, then even that, that same moment doesn't have as much of an effect. So that means you have spin stabilized your object. So this is the spin stabilization of the Frisbee. Spin. Stabilization of Frisbee. Should that be phi dot or theta dot? This is phi dot. So I, I'm just using this, so phi dot.
right? Theta is the is about the B3 axis, but phi is about the B1 axis, the way that I'm doing it here. Does that make sense? Yeah. When you just toss the frisbee, it's tumbling in pitch. When you get it spinning, it actually now, it's not tumbling, it's just kind of slowly turning and roll. Okay, I was just making sure, because you said theta at the time and wrote ah, phi. Okay. So I just wanted to make gotcha. sure. Okay, thanks. So you can try this. I tried this with something that wasn't even a Frisbee. I just went outside, had my uh, one of my sons film it, so it's kind of all over the place. Frisbee, right-handed throw from behind. Do we want to see that? Okay, so that's me, it's my yard. So our prediction is that this thing should veer left. I have, uh, I think the sound is on here. I'm gonna throw this disc-like thing. It's a disc-like thing. Right-handed, usual throw. Right-handed. You saw it, oh, what do you know? Tilt it to the turn. left. Turn. Left. All right. And now a, oh, this is just coming at you. But where will it go? It'll go that way. Okay, great. Now a, a left-handed throw should go the opposite way, taking the same disc-like object. And it veers, right, rolls to the right. So. So see if you can you get the same thing doing that qualitative analysis. If you think of other things to do qualitative analysis on, you know, just let me know. Always looking for more, more examples. Um, so the spin stabilization of the frisbee is one thing. It's not a terribly uh, engineering application, um, but what did we do? We we avoided a pitch instability by spinning rapidly about the B, uh, by spinning rapidly about the B2 axis, symmetry axis. So we get a uh, slow turn, turning about the B3 axis. I think it's B, what did we get? We did rapid spinning about B2. Yeah, we got slow spinning about the B1 axis. Okay, so it's rotationally stabilized. There's other, there's other examples. where this gets used, um, like rockets and missiles. So if we have, let me show a, a figure, and I, this is from, this is a spinning prolate object. So what do we have? Here it is. Why would they want to spin stabilize a rocket? Because if the thrust coming out of the back isn't exactly along the axis of the body, if it's a little bit off, you're gonna have problems, right? The, the missile will not go where you want. So this, this thrust is actually attached to the rocket. If you, if you don't have it initially spinning, then uh, this is going down. But if you get the rocket spinning, it kind of makes sense. Well, that that offset of, of, of the thrust will just lead to some kind of corkscrewing, but it won't um, lead to disaster. And I think I have some videos of corkscrewing rockets, which were, I don't think they were intended. Um, this is just sort of showing the smoke path of a corkscrewing rocket. This was a model rocket where I think they weren't trying to spin stabilize it, but it just kind of shows you the thrust was offset and things happen. Uh, here's a rocket launch where I 
Ready? think it actually does Ready in five, corkscrew. Four, three, two, one, launch. So yeah, you can, you can definitely see the corkscrew. So the, the thrust, it's hard to make thrust go exactly um, on the um, kind of cool. certain direction. So to take into account for that, then you can spin stabilize. So you get this thing rapidly rotating and then it'll fly more straight rather than disaster. Uh, what's another one? You may have seen it in there. American footballs. American footballs. They're the famous spiral throw that the quarterback does. So you throw a spiral <clears throat> for um, to spin stabilize this thing. Otherwise, I think it's called a duck when it's not thrown very well. Uh, I think uh, Tom Brady threw a duck this past week, but it was caught. That's what matters. So a football is another prolate thing where if you wanted to go and you know, not suffer some strange aer aerodynamic force. This is a way of uh, overcoming the uncertainty of what aerodynamic forces will do is you get this thing spinning and then um, it'll balance out any aer aerodynamic forces so that it's, uh, you get the trajectory that you want.